Hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. Uh, my name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the co-chair of the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of the uh, Lunchtime Learning Series from Green New York. Um, first off today, uh, some housekeeping. I'd like to thank all of our veterans for their service. Yesterday was Veterans Day, um, and we had the day off, but I just want to thank everybody who is a veteran who's on the line today um, for their service and all that they've done for our country. A um, couple other housekeeping things. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted up on the Green New York website like the other ones are to find afterwards. So if you know of folks uh, who weren't able to make it today, they can still uh, view it there. In addition, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat box as we go along. Everybody is on mute right now and uh, we will get to the questions at the end. In addition, our presenter today has asked that if you have tips or tricks, as we're going along or you have your own recipes or things that you do, type them into the chat box. We want to get to those at the end. and um, We kind of want to have this snowball, if you will. Um, I'll give Gary credit for that pun um, into kind of a collaborative process. So a couple other quick Green New York things here. We have a couple new working groups if you're interested in joining. Uh, we're doing one on sustainable swag. We're also doing one on green purchasing for apparel, so clothing that agencies purchase. And we also have a working group on water conservation signage. So if you are interested in any of those, uh, type it into the chat box. We'll get in touch with you. Uh, we love your thoughts on those. And our next webinar will be on Tuesday, December 10th at noon. It is on climate-friendly eating, and it is with yours truly. So you're stuck with me for 30 minutes next month. Um, without further ado, uh, we're going to hand it over to today's presenter. Uh, we've got Gary Feinland from the Organics Reduction and Recycling Unit here at DEC. He does a fantastic job when it comes to composting uh, and all things reducing food waste. He also was our first presenter last November, um, and he's back again. So uh, let's hand it over to Gary. All right. Thank you, Brenton. <laughs> What? Well, our computer just crashed, so I will continue to talk while Brendan sets that up. I'm going to be talking about wasted food reduction. And so those of you who have um, been at the webinar series since the beginning, I did talk about composting, and I am often a compost educator. I've been making a transition to wasted food reduction because of the significant uh, impacts of growing food on the environment and storing that food and transporting that food. So if you think about the water and the fertilizer and the energy resources that it takes to um, produce and get food to our mouths, it's significant. And composting can't touch any of those impacts. It's only effective at the end of the life cycle of the food. So um, here we are with our computer still down. So what I'm going to do, unless Brendan says otherwise, is just continue with um, going through my slides, and then we'll catch up. I'm going to guess it's going to be about five minutes, but that is not a promise. And I'm going to just uh, start going through this. Bear with me for a second. So if we look at the what we often call a municipal solid waste stream, you would find that about 30% of it is organics. And the organics, and the, so municipal, we're talking about residents, we're talking about um, institutions and commercial establishments, grocery stores, restaurants, et cetera. And of that 30% of this stream, most of it is food scraps, with the remaining being yard trimmings and soiled paper that can't be recycled. And if you were to look at a graph of how we're doing with recycling these organics, and you looked at the two biggest, yard trimmings and uh, food scraps, what you would see is that for yard trimmings, we reclaim somewhere around 65% by our estimates. So what I'm saying is 
uh, instead of going to landfill or in combustion, about 65% is reclaimed primarily through, <laughs> hello computer, primarily through composting. If you looked at food scraps, you'd see that we generate about 3 million tons a year of food scraps, and we reclaim either through donation, animal feeding, or composting, about 3%. So we have a long ways to go. Part of that is that we don't have the compost facilities and anaerobic digestion facilities, which is another way to recycle food scraps, that we don't have enough capacity in the state, and part of it is just that we've always done things a certain way. Um, we certainly could have more food going to donation, and um, we're working on that. So composting is only part of the solution. It's relatively low down on a food recovery hierarchy with wasted food reduction and donation being towards the top. Now there is a wonderful seminal study that came out in 2012 and has since been updated in 2017 called Wasted. And it was put out by the Natural Resources Defense Council. So one more maybe, keep going, there, go back. All right, so great, thank you, Brendan. Um, hopefully you folks could now see the screen and that would be lovely so you could follow along. And um, if you can see the screen and you can see we're on the wasted food slide, please type it into the chat box. Uh, we should be good to go. Um, our apologies for the technical difficulties. All right. So what we're looking at here is the amount, the percentage of wasted food from the different supply chains. And what stands out right away is that households are the biggest part of that. So when we think of wasted food or food waste, we often think of, oh, it's being wasted on the farm. And yes, 16% is being wasted on the farm. And there is a considerable amount of waste in the grocery stores and restaurants and institutional food service like cafeterias. And by the way, that chunk, grocery stores, restaurants, institutional food service, that's us too, because we're eating at those places, right? So we have the biggest ability to impact change. This is another look at that looking at the value in terms of dollars of that food that's wasted. And you can see on the right-hand side, we are an outsized portion of the dollar value of food wasted because retail is more expensive than wholesale. So this uh, is one of the resources, savethefood.com, and we're gonna go to this Life of a Strawberry, it's a one minute video that lets us really look at where all the inputs are and how we can just waste less uh, food by eating what we can.
So, right, wasting food wastes everything, water, labor, fuel, money, and love. You probably caught the love scene between the lime and the strawberry there. And it just hits home how much um, we waste when we waste food. It's not just the moldy strawberries going into the garbage. And yes, it does hurt to watch that and know that they're not even composting it. You know, there have been studies that show that home composters or people who contract for a compost service have less guilt around wasting food because they are, at least they're composting it. And composting is great, but if you could have used the food, you, you know there's all these um, inputs that went into growing the food. This just really, what I want to take away, you to take away from this relatively complicated slide is that about 20% of the resources used to grow food are wasted. Fertilizer, the cropland itself, water. And Let's talk a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions. So Project Drawdown, it's this book and it's a series of um, local discussions that have grown from the book about the hundred things we could do to reduce our impact on climate change, on emissions of greenhouse gases. And number 60 is composting, because when, uh, if you compost, then it's not going into a landfill, which is the majority of the way garbage is managed in the state, and it's not producing methane. Reducing wasted food is number three because of all the impacts that we've talked about. So here's uh, from the WAR model, which is US EPA's model, you could see that uh, landfilling produces some uh, greenhouse gases. Land and this is landfilling of food. And if you click it again, we'll see that composting has a net positive, as does anaerobic digestion, but wasted food has a much bigger or, uh, net positive on the environment. So you could see what a large impact we could have by just wasting less food, and especially in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So we have some solutions, outreach and education, funding, legislation. I'm going to talk about those quickly. So we have Save the Food, which you've seen. Uh, that's a national um, resource. One of the resources on Save the Food is the guesstimator, which is a way that you could figure out how much food you need to buy. You input the number of guests, you input whether they're big eaters or small eaters, you input uh, whether you want leftovers or not. So for instance, for Thanksgiving, which is coming up, you could get an idea of what size turkey you wanna buy, how many potatoes you wanna buy. And the US EPA has some uh, food to good to waste program with some tools and tips for people to waste less in their homes. One is to measure it, and so you don't need a special EPA bag to do this, but by measuring what you put out by volume so you don't have to use a scale. If you have a compost been just taking a note of what you're collecting in your kitchen before you bring it out to the compost bin is a great way to see what you're eating and not, and maybe think about how you could eat more of it. So one way to reduce your wasted food is that when you're shopping, you have a list that is tied to the things that you're gonna make for the week. Now, I have to disclaimer, I don't plan for a week. That's not who I am. Some people in the audience surely do and some don't. But to even plan a few days out 
is quite helpful for reducing the amount of wasted food because you know what you're shopping for. Another tool is an eat me first bowl or box. I have a red bowl in my fridge that where you put the things that you know are going to go bad soon if you don't eat them. It could be, besides the items you see there, it could be half a pepper. Um, let's say I've used some garlic and I own, didn't need all of the cloves. And I, so I had half a clove left over for some reason. That's a great thing to put in a bowl or a box that it doesn't like fall through or I store ginger that way and other things that you can uh, get at quickly. So that when you have the opportunity and you're thinking and planning about dinner, you could go to your bowl or box first and see what's in there and it helps you. Now, I'll say one thing about milk. There's a sell by date on milk. It's the date in which the grocery store wants to sell it by. It's not the date that it goes bad by. It's usually about 10 days if it's stored in a fridge around 40 degrees after that date that it's maybe starting to go bad. And if you have a good sniffer, your nose, and it smells good, it pretty much is good for milk. All right. Along with outreach and education, NYSTAR 3, which is the New York State Association of, Re of Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling, we have a food recovery campaign where we're trying to bring donation and wasted food reduction to light. We've been doing some local events uh, here at DEC and with partners, and we've developed these legal fact sheets for donation through Harvard, and they've done that for other states as well so that folks who can donate, um, like grocery stores and restaurants, can feel like they're doing it in the proper way. This is just NYSAR's Facebook page. Next, please. Twitter, go on. Uh, just one of the tweets, and uh, you can see Christine's name down there. She's one of our tweeters along with Naseba, and we have other folks. Just a shout out to some of my DEC uh, colleagues. I don't tweet very well. <laughs> we also have this pledge campaign. So uh, you could see on the left-hand side, it lays out some of the things that we can all do to reduce wasted food. We produce magnets, and we have some available. If you really want a magnet, you could reach out to me, and we could probably get one to you. So you put it on your fridge, and it's a reminder for things that you could do. To this is just uh, an event that was held recently that looked at how you could reduce wasted food and asked people to take the pledge next. Uh, the display that we have here that we take out and we'd be happy to come to events if you had some that you wanted us to participate in. One of the solutions I mentioned is legislation. So uh, through the last budget cycle, we got a law that requires large generators, those that generate over or equal to two tons or more per week on an annual basis, that they donate the maximum amount of good edible food, and that they also recycle either to a compost facility or an anaerobic digester if one is within 25 miles and has the capacity to take their food scraps. It also requires that DEC provide some waste reduction tips and resources to municipalities so that they could educate their residents. Some folks are exempt from the law. New York City is exempt because they have their own law. Uh, hospitals, nursing homes, K through 12 schools are exempt, colleges are not. Um, and a lot of people have issues with the fact that K through 12 schools are exempt, but Realize that there's only two school districts in the entire state that generate two tons or more per week as far as we can estimate. 
so, and we don't preclude any of those exempt entities from not donating and recycling their food scraps. It's just not a requirement. And we've given funding out. We've been fortunate enough to get funding through the budget process and have been giving that money away and mostly as a 50% reimbursement grant to municipalities as well as to uh, food pantries, other emergency feeding organizations, and to the 10 food banks around the state. We've also looked at a repair cafes model and are, have just started demoing a recook cafe kind of idea where we share tips on how to use more of the food that we all have in our homes. So that concludes this portion of it, but I would, and by the way, we'll go back for a second if you don't mind, Brendan. That's from a waste audit we did here. I really didn't eat what was on that giant, let's call it a spatula, um, but we do an annual audit here to get an idea of how much we're wasting and what we could do, not just for food, but all recyclables and stuff as well. Uh, so, this is the portion when I'm hoping we could have a dialogue about what else we could do to reduce wasted food. Maybe you have something that you do at home. Uh, I'll start us off with a classic one, which is to have a bag in the freezer where you store vegetable scraps that you're not going to use in your cooking, not going to use for a meal at the moment, that you could put in there like the tops of onions, cores of tomatoes, uh, peelings from carrots. Although I have to say my colleague Molly put me on something a few months ago that I'm sure some of you know, which is that most carrots, um, except the most bitter, you don't have to peel at all. If you wash them good, they are all set to eat. I will say. If I can just chime in for a second with the yeah, carrots. Yeah, go. When you do peel the carrots, if you crisp them in a um, toaster oven or in the oven, they come out really good. Put some olive oil and salt on those. Um, it's kind of like a carrot potato chip or a carrot skin. Yeah. Um, I, I do really like that. And potatoes, a lot of people do cook potatoes with the skin on. Um, if you do peel them, I, I tend to peel them myself when I use them for recipes. The skins, if you put those into the oven, are fantastic afterwards. When little olive them. oil, little salt, pepper. Yep. And you can also throw those on things. So I like texture in a lot of the meals that I, you know, some sort of crunchiness to them. Um, poutine is a good example. Usually we think of it as a pretty soft and mushy type dish. But you if have you to tell the, people what that is. Oh, yes. Um, the classic Canadian uh, dish of French fries, gravy, and cheese. <laughs> um, I should say French Canadian, um, mm -hmm. but um, but if you put those potato skins on top, it adds a little crunch to it, and it's really good. You can do that with basically any dish. Um, so right now, what we kind of want you guys to do is type into the chat box and let us know, um, you know, if you have any questions, um, or also what you do or what your recipes are uh, to help reduce wasted food. And I think my favorite one um, that saves a lot more food than the just the um, skins there is tacos. Everybody loves tacos. Mm -hmm. If you say we're having tacos for dinner tonight, even though you're just putting leftovers in a tortilla, your kids will get excited because it's taco night. Um, you can even make tacos the le or Tuesdays the leftover night with Taco Tuesdays and anything you have left over from a Sunday meal or Monday night, you just throw into a taco. I have yet to find a food that when I put it into a tortilla and put sauce on top of it is not good. <laughs> That's awesome. So there's my kind of tip to everybody is, is think tacos. Uh, and we have uh, a question here. Um, is it possible to run through the first couple of slides again since things weren't working too well from the beginning? Um, I think what we'll do is um, we can send that out if anybody would like the uh, PowerPoint. Um, most of those slides were some facts and figures and things, so it'd be easier for us to just send those out afterwards so we can do that. And of course, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, you could send them to me through my email, which is in the PowerPoint. And if you have suggestions, um, for things you do and you don't want to say it online or through the chat, rather, 
uh, you could email that as well. But we'd love to have um, kind of a dialogue going as as I'm um, doing education around wasted food reduction. Every time I go to a group, I always learn something because it just so happens that we all eat and we generally don't want to waste that food. So, yeah, and we have our first couple coming in here. Uh, the first one is, I use odd bits of food in my Nutribullet for smoothies, such as the core of a pineapple or herb stems, which I would not normally eat outright. Wow, yeah, that's great. It's really hard to uh, eat pineapple core. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. And, you know, that that's, um, brings me to broccoli stems or the stems of other... Uh, not other, the stems of herbs like parsley, basil. They can be used. When they're woody, it's really tough to use them, and somebody might have experience with that. I don't. But I'm a big fan of chopping fine. If you chop things fine, you can usually use them in whatever you're cooking the rest. Like if you're putting parsley in something and you're chopping the stems fine, then that's going to be great. Another thing is carrot tops. So there's, you can find a recipe for carrot top pesto. It's really good. The carrot tops have a kind of brightness that basil doesn't, and so mixing it with basil, um, it's really, it's delicious. Do you know if carrot top sells as pesto at farmer's markets? <laughs> I didn't seen... know he was a chef. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, That's some good of to you know. <laughs> younger folks might not get that reference, but you can just look up Carrot Top, but I suggest you don't watch it for more than like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next tip we have here, I pack up leftovers from dinners or restaurants into containers for lunches and freeze them, then I have them to grab and go. That's great. Mm -hmm. And leftovers are, are great. Um, one of the things that I will say with leftovers, though, is there is a lot of packaging waste from that. Um, a lot of times when you come away from a restaurant, you might get um, polystyrene um, foam containers. Um, you might get odd small bits of um, plastics that aren't entirely recyclable at a lot of um, facilities. So if right. you can bring your own container, do so. They make some really cool ones that are collapsible now. You can throw them in your purse or your bag, um, and then you can just fill them with your leftovers, and that way you have a true zero-waste solution. And it, it's a great thing that happened in the last 10 years. Um, Perhaps I, like some other diners, were thinking, what the heck? Now you have to box up your own. They don't take it back in the kitchen. But they would never be able to take your container back in the kitchen. But if you box it yourself at the table, then you have the power to put it in whatever container you want to put it in. Mm -hmm. And every time I've done this in a restaurant, I've had multiple people, including the server, say, that's such a cool idea. I mm -hmm. should look for something like that. So it is something that, you know, at first somebody might, huh, what do they do? Oh, that's really smart. So that's always the reaction I've gotten from people. So the next comment we have here is, I buy local, so foods aren't trucked all over the country and organic so that I don't have to peel. If I do peel veggies, I put the peels and any ends that are cut off into the freezer to use a soup broth. Awesome. Yeah, broth is a really good way to use those, as Gary was mentioning earlier, kind of the stalks and other things. They can work really well for that. Um, the next comment here is, think taco, think soup too. Vegetable soup has no boundaries and small quantities of different veggies mixed together with a chicken or veggie stock and a pasta or bean can make a really delicious soup. This is true. I did not mean to give soup short shrift. <laughs> Just uh, as I was heading over to the webinar, a colleague of mine, Molly, said, hey, guess what I did last night, or I think it was last night, this weekend anyway, made soup stock out of her chicken bones. So I just love that, it, you know, it happens all over the place. We're, we're saving our food all over the place and just being aware and sharing it. And it's a great way to build community, you know, because... Okay, so when I do compost education and I ask people in an audience, hey, how many of you compost? Maybe a third, may, maybe less. How many of you eat? How many of you want to waste less food and keep more of it yourself? Every, all of us do. Mm -hmm. So this weekend when you're watching the Bills beat the Dolphins and you've got those silver <laughs> wing I don't bones, think that's gonna you happen, can make right? a nice stock out of those. <laughs> 
Um, so the next comment we have here, great point about the carrot and potato peel crisps. It adds some great texture. I like to make leftover burrito bowls for lunch with leftover bits from dinner, rice, pasta, veggies, fish, chicken, whatever I've got. That's another really good point as well. Um, and one of the things you can think about is um, things like rice or quinoa or other sort of grains or um, tortillas even if you put them in the fridge last a long time. So if you have those kind of bases and you have them ready to go in your pantry, any kind of leftovers you have you can turn into something else. Yeah, and the other thing is don't forget about your freezer. Like for instance for Thanksgiving. You could look up what freezes well from my Thanksgiving dinner and you'll find turkey and various other things that freeze well. And the thing about freezing is put it in the size that you think you'll want to use it for. A lot of this using more of the food we have is having a plan for what you're going to do with it and mark those containers or bags that you're storing in so you know. In fact, sometimes I'll mark it with the amount, like a cup of whatever, so, so that it's easy to just take it out, defrost it, and do something with it. Although it is fun to occasionally play freezer roulette when you can't identify what's back there. Um, <laughs> right. We want to be using the food up, but that is an entertaining game once you've uh, been saving a lot of stuff. And if you don't date it, then you don't know if it's good or not. So for instance, most meats uh, have, a, have a certain shelf life, uh, safety-wise, uh, whether they're refrigerated or frozen. So it's good to look that up and, and know. Mm -hmm. The question for the participants, how do you feel with, or how do you deal with right sizing events and parties that are catered on site or off site? So I, I assume the question is about the right sizing of the amount of food that you're serving for a catered event. Because I know a lot of times when we've had catering or something else, you get to, you know, you buy it by the, the tray or buy a certain set amount and a lot of times um, you know, they'll say this much for this many people and you end up with quite a bit. So. Right. And I will say, if you're donating, the liability exemptions that exist that are federal liability exemptions, and you could look up by going to, because I had a, a slide that would get you to our fact sheets, um, they're for food that is properly handled and not served. So let's say you were doing some sort of catering and you wanted to, you thought you might have some leftover, keep it back in the kitchen area where it's not being served. And then you could donate that knowing that it was handled properly and um, wasn't served to folks. That's not to say you can't donate any of that food, but realize that the liability exemptions would not then apply. Now, is that something you could write into the contract or ask the caterer for that all leftover food would be donated? Yeah, it's challenging right now. We often hear from caterers that they they don't do that. They're not allowed. They don't understand the law. So um, we still have work to do. Luckily, a lot of catering services um, give some of the food to staff, which is great. But um, we want to make sure that as much gets eaten as can be eaten. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have another comment here, peelings, onions, leeks, carrots, celery, uh, they place those into the freezer and then when they've collected enough, they make vegetable or other soup broths for them, uh, including garlic peelings and herb stems. So soup seems to be pretty popular amongst our crowd today. Yes, and getting back to that question about how much do you prepare for a catered event, you know, that's not my area. I'm sure there's some tips for things that can be prepared that can stretch the meal if other things go. You know, we're really big in this country about abundance of food and making sure we never run out. And caterers especially, that's their bread and butter. <laughs> so they have to make sure they have enough food. But um, yeah, so some other folks might be able to answer that question better. And we'll keep up with it if anyone comes in chatting about that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier about um, events that DEC has done and coming out to places. So if folks, um, you know, maybe they have some sort of lunchtime Q&A thing at their office or something else at their agency or school, um, is, should they just reach out to you um, about potentially doing some outreach? Sure they can. 
um, yes, we'll try to do the best we can. I, I want to mention that we run an organic summit every year, and this year it's going to be at the Capitol Center here in Albany. And when we mentioned donation to them, they were very comfortable with it, which was so refreshing. And in fact, if any of you get the traffic announcements from the traffic lady, Debbie Gedicke, over at the Albany Visitor Center, um, she has, one of the things she does is connects entities that are looking to donate in the Capital District with folks that need it. So, and it often goes to the Capital City Mission, which is, um, not far from the Capitol Center. So that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. So if you do have any other questions, please type them into the chat box or if you have recipes or other thoughts uh, when it comes to how you reduce wasted food. Um, one more thing I will um, ask you about here, Gary, while we've got you, is um, you mentioned the pledge. Um, mm -hmm. Can you let them uh, let people know a little bit more about if they wanted to have their staff take the pledge at the office or do something like that, what they would have to do for that? Sure. I believe in this PowerPoint, I included a link. It's just a Google form, and you call up the Google form, and then you could literally check the circles. Um, so you probably could go to it now, Brennan, if you wanted to, and we could. I don't know if that's going to work. I can't work. bring it up, yeah. No, I didn't have it as a hyperlink. But yeah, it, it would just basically show you what you're looking at on the left and then you can take the pledge, put your name in, and it just goes to our little database. We don't do anything with that except use it as a, a tally, but it's been shown that when you take a pledge, you're more likely to do the actions in the pledge, and that's, that's the purpose for, of it. And is there any kind of hashtag or anything else that people are posting to social media about or any kind of Facebook groups when it comes to the pledge or people sharing ideas or anything like that? Mm. Um, not that I know of. Um, the colleagues I spoke of before are more savvy about like mm, the hashtag thing. So I don't, I don't have a good answer there, but you know, locally there are always groups who are into slow food and local food, and so there's a great tie-in between that and wasting less food. Mm -hmm. uh, when is the Organic Summit at the Capitol Center again? It's April 7th and 8th. Mm -hmm. And again, if you have any final questions, please type them into the chat box here. Um, any final thoughts, Gary? Uh, just that I, it's a journey, and I would say if you're a composter, don't let that stop you from trying to use as much of the food you have uh, to eat more of it yourself. Save money. And one of the things that I didn't get out there is that the typical family of four would save about $1,800 a year if they didn't waste food. So that means even if you're living alone, you're throwing away over $400 of wasted food every year on average. I'm sure some of you are better than, than others, but um, once you start, you begin to see opportunities abound, and a lot of it is about planning. So if you have uh, a meal and you know you're going to have something as you're cutting and chopping, like you have a giant onion and it only calls for some a less amount of onion, what are you going to do with that? Some people pickle onions. In fact, red onions pickle well. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to in the next couple of days. You just watch. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and as your coworker, I will suggest that you bring some in to make sure that there's none left that are wasted. I got gotcha. you. Sounds good. Um, so thanks a lot, everybody, for being on the webinar today. Um, again, our next webinar is on Tuesday, December 10th at noon on climate-friendly eating, so we're sticking with the food topic for another month. Uh, I'd like to wish everybody uh, and your families a very happy uh, and healthy Thanksgiving uh, and one that has a lot less wasted food. So right. thanks a lot, Gary. Thank you. Bye, everybody.